Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Towards Data Science Podcast. And if you follow the podcast and you're interested in ML research, then chances are pretty good that you've watched Yannick Kilcher's YouTube channel before. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. He's got great walkthroughs of cutting edge papers and ML news, and it's actually where I turned to understand the original Attention is All You Need paper a while ago. Now Yannick's joining us today to talk about what he's learned from years of following, reporting on, and doing AI research, including the trends, challenges, and opportunities opportunities that he thinks are going to be most important to the near and long-term future of AI. So buckle up if you're in a car or a motorized vehicle of some kind, strap in if you're in a Falcon 9, I guess, or just sit back because it's time to talk about the 10,000 foot view on AI for this episode of the Towards Data Science Podcast. I mean, I've been following your YouTube channel for a really long time. I'm sort of one of, I don't want to say my main source of news, because I feel like if I say that about ML, this really starts to make me seem like a, a, a you know, very <laughs> low level non-aficionado type. But I do watch the uh, the channel quite a bit. It's a great way to get an overview of what's going on in machine learning broadly. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners do too. I'm just curious if we could start with what got you kind of into machine learning generally, and then we'll, we'll talk about that path. But what was your path into, into ML? Sure. Um, I don't even remember clearly, but I, I think so during my bachelor's, I had no idea this existed. I had like one pattern recognition class, but I was really into networks and, and stuff like that. So <laughs> I, I switched to ETH Zurich for my master's and then I just somehow happened to take all the, all the ML classes, which was mostly computer vision at that time. Some stati like statistical learning theory, some big data. What, what year was this that you were just getting in? 2015, I started my, my master's. No, 2013, sorry, 2015, I started okay. the PhD. So 2013, it was, so, so yeah, deep learning wasn't a thing yet. And machine learning was, yeah, it existed, but, you know, people, computer vision, the, the biggest, you know, the state of the art was like some, some kind of cool SIFT descriptors or SURF descriptors. And then you would map, you would like match key points in images and you would try to understand images by using some sort of a structured SVM, things like this. I, I thought that that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. And then I heard someone was like, oh, someone has a master thesis offered in, in deep learning, right? And it had like a bit of a class in um, on, on graphical models, which was sort of the intermediate step between, I don't know, like the, the classic world of like SVMs and, and general linear models. And so there's a graphical models with message passing algorithms. And that sort of got me interested in deep learning. Uh, so I was promised a master thesis on deep learning. It ended up being convex optimization, but you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that that was that was pretty much my path. I didn't know it existed, and then and I just happened to stumble. And the timing there is really interesting. You know, talking about twenty thirteen to the extent that you were at least vaguely in the space. Like this is immediately post AlexNet. Everything is just being revolutionized at that time. Did you have an awareness that AlexNet was a thing at that point? Was that part of uh, what played into your decision? Not, I, I didn't hear if Alex not exactly, but you know, you hear rumors, right, right. Of, of, of this deep learning stuff that can now, that is now good and, and can now do things, right? So uh, I heard the first, some sort of like applications to medical images and image analysis using deep learning. And, and I just, I just thought the word sounded cool, right? It's like wide neural networks and, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> So I heard of like perceptrons before, but yeah, briefly, briefly in the ML classes. So that was essentially. I think that, it. that kind of so there there was a feeling in the air, you know. Yeah, but, yeah. But it wasn't it wasn't like something you could you could exactly name uh, from from not being a PhD student. Well, that almost gets us right to this issue of machine learning being in the news and people hearing about it and actually kind of absorbing what's going on because it's a space where so much is happening especially nowadays that catching up or keeping up with the, the field seems like 
I don't want to say a hopeless task, but it, it seems almost impossible. I'm, I'm curious about how you started, okay, so how you started the YouTube channel and then what you do today to stay on top of things. Like how does the ultimate like machine learning research dimensionality reducer, dimensionality reduces information? Well, it's, it is, as you say, a hopeless task. So I used to read all of our archive or, or at least the, the relevant lists in our archive. So wow. like the, obviously the stat ML, then like LG, C computer vision, uh, all of these, these kind of lists I was subscribed to. I had a little script that every morning would download all the papers and I would just not read them, but like flick through every one of them every morning on the train. Wow. That took, you know, flicking through them took, I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour. You know, you, you know some, most of them, the title already is like, nah, nah, nah. But still, so I used to be able to do that. And that nowadays, this is just hopeless. It, it not even, you can't even read all the titles that appear and do still. Do you remember when that threshold reading. was crossed? I, I don't know. I don't. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I, st I just started it for me because I sort of got into the PhD, not really knowing, still not really knowing what machine learning is, but also not really knowing what a PhD is. So, um, I, I thought, you know, I'd educate myself as much as possible, at least about the machine learning part. Um, so I tried to stay on top of things, but I don't remember. But at, at some point there was just this like super duper increase and I had other things to do than reading archive. And now it's just, it's impossible. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to say I have a good method of reducing information. I, I am victim to the same stuff as anyone else. So I, I read I read a bunch of like, sometimes I'll scroll through archive or there's, there's things like archive sanity, but there's also Reddit and Twitter and various blogs and then various discord servers where people dump interesting papers and the, 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 agglo like the agglomeration of all of that sort of becomes my information diet. That kind of makes sense. I mean, it's like how most of us get our news about most things at this point. It's just so the proliferation of, of researchers and research is like it's to such an extent that there's really no hope of doing it any other way. Um, but then I guess at some point you have to make the choice as well of like what stories are newsworthy, like what what ML news actually makes it onto the, the channel. That's another thing I'm wondering about. Like, what do you find compelling? Let's say especially nowadays, like what are the things that people should be keeping track of and how does that play into what you choose to show and don't? Well, as as for the papers that I sort of present it's mostly my it's like my own interest like if if i read a paper i might as well make a video of it that, that's my logic so i there, there's no other criterion than i read this I, it doesn't mean i liked or didn't like it or anything it's just like it was interesting enough for me that i said you know i i'll give it a read seems seems cool or seems interesting um as and then other topics like news it's I guess, again, just what interests me, what, what I would like to know, right. If I didn't like, <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't, I don't have, I've never claimed and I don't want to claim that I'm some sort of an arbiter of what's, what's noteworthy and what isn't. I, in fact, I'd, I'd love there to be more channels like mine and there are right and and that that do different things slightly different things maybe sometimes the same and that we can sort of provide a more well-rounded picture of the space yeah yeah and actually those those personal filters that we all apply anytime we kind of do our own news parsing are really interesting because they do sometimes differ from what gets covered in you know your classic kind of tech reporting I've, I've seen a couple of stories that you've covered through a more skeptical lens, and I'd love to get your sense of like where you think news coverage tends to fail most badly when it comes to machine learning and AI, and like you know the direction you would nudge it. I probably fall into the same traps as, as many others. Maybe, maybe I have I have some some different things. There, there are some narratives that are that are sort of overarching that I see and where I am almost like reactionarily immediately skeptic for example like uh what was like all all the all the all the autonomous methods inherently they are inhuman they don't understand anything um they they they, they are they're oh so biased and and terrible and they 
what is it? Tell people to kill themselves. They're unsafe. Right. Like, yes. Th there's this there's this notion where it's pretty easy. Like people buy this pretty easily, which is and it's true to some to some extent, right? But but then you know people tend to lean into it. Sure. I think journalists know if they write a story like this, it will immediately receive a good reception by their audiences and. So in, in these cases, I tend to be more a bit skeptical and be like, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> but then I, I probably have my own my own weak spots uh, for things that I just think are really cool, but maybe deserve a bit more skepticism. So, you know, I don't know how, how would I want it to change? I maybe maybe it. It's not super. It's not super expressed in our field, but it's always good to not have that much of a monoculture. So just like different opinions, like like people people just saying different things, voicing different opinions. I, I feel in our it's not too extreme in our field, so it's already okay. Yeah, yeah. It, there there definitely seems to be that vibe. I agree. At least you know from my particular corner of the universe, it it does feel like when you see a news article, you could have a pretty good prior that if it has to do with AI, the arguments in it are going to be net AI negative and net AI negative in a way that isn't, I don't know, I, I tend to feel like not the most interesting way to be uh, bearish on the, the tech. Like there are legitimate issues that people have flagged, issues around alignment. These things are interesting like and, and they have potential consequences, but um, not to downplay the, uh, the importance of something like AI ethics. I think there are interesting conversations to be had there. But it so quickly feels like a kind of microcosm for general political discourse that people read into these things behaviors that they really want to see because it's validating somehow to to a, to a prior. Um, I don't know if that's part of what you're you're gesturing at here, but that's certainly something that I've I've perceived at my end. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so yeah, there, there's there's on one side there is this some of these topics which. Yeah, you can almost predict if a, if a let's say a tech journalist writes about them, you can almost predict what's in there. And you're absolutely right. And yeah, there, there's also the, the sort of related thing about sort of the study of the field itself, which also has these these sort of the, the, like the narratives. And so whenever I whenever I see something where like a lot of people agree unreasonably much. That's when I become a little bit skeptical. Right, I think right, every, right. I think that happens to everyone, right? Um, so yeah, we're we're not like independent ensemble learners. We uh, we become highly correlated very easily. Um, sure. <laughs> no, I, well, one thing I'm 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 wondering about. I'm still trying to figure this out for myself. Is we've had a lot of um, a mix of like AI ethicists and computer scientists who are focused on AI ethics and and AI, AI fairness, all that stuff. I'm still trying to tease apart like what parts of uh, of this problem are both interest like legitimately interesting and tractable because one of the issues that i found come up a lot is you know you'll you'll have um observations like well you know machine learning models reflect the biases that are already intrinsic in society and there's sort of this like dot 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 thing that happens and then you're left hanging wondering what the implication is like what should be done um, and a little bit, frankly, confused. And I think this is where a lot of people get confused about what AI ethics even is, because it often doesn't seem to, it seems to want to be technical, but it's not technical and we're not supposed to do anything about it, but we should. Like, I, I wonder if, again, I mean, you know, you're not an AI ethicist, that's totally fine, but I'm just wondering, given the fact that you've had this chance to look at the news from a, a 10,000 foot view for a long time, and you've been in the space for a while, are there like what are the most interesting AI ethics issues that you see today that you think maybe deserve a little bit more attention than they're getting right now? Ethics is a big field, right? Um, I yeah. mean, it, this is there, there are so there are many many questions in there, and I don't even want to say that it's not it's it's not like it is completely necessary sometimes to to just uh, speak about a problem without always having to come up with a solution. Like that's you know that that's that's completely cool. So I don't I don't want to say like you always have to have to bring a solution no it's it's completely fine to just say look here's a problem um and, and just leave people hanging like this. Yeah, yeah. um interesting questions i'm i'm not i'm not, i think that i think this the standard question like standard quote-unquote questions that people raise are 
are mostly really legitimate questions like um you know do do we are we going towards sort of a technocratic world what does it mean if we hand over control of our lives to algorithms um algorithms you know that are first of all not human which means there, there's no there's no saying like ah you know come on i have a bit of a special situation right can you maybe yeah. this time yeah. so there, there's none of that right but then also in a way of not only are these algorithms but they're algorithms that are statistically derived from from data and all the all the problems that go into into that like um you know what, what data how, how is it how is it collected what does that mean because you know you, you can't blame the models necessarily because you know if you feed data to a model you, you're essentially saying you know this is your world like, yeah you, you know like the, to the model the data that comes in that's the world of the model and and um so i see like yeah you pick pick your favorite ai ethics question um it is an interesting question Abs absolutely as you say it then sometimes turns into a battleground for i don't know person bigger bigger issues or, or or political issues or something like this um though i do know that there are a lot of ai ethicists maybe with a lesser profile because they don't shout as much but yeah. um that that actually you know try to try to really uh, calmly and and well neutrally but at least like cooperatively work towards a solution yeah, it is. It is definitely the case that there's there does seem to be that bifurcation, or not bifurcation, but there's a a, a continuum, let's say, of of, uh, of shouting and, and thinking that goes on in the ecosystem. Um, it's it's also you know it's it's one of those things that makes me wonder about the direction of the field on the whole, because to some degree you do have people who are trying to build important things, who do their best work when everything's nice and quiet. One of the areas I've I've heard this set of is AI alignment research, where you're really looking at in principle, what could be very high stakes stuff. And to the extent that we're having these conversations out in the open talking about what is the loss function that the, you know, the, the full AI that will eventually run humanity will run on. Like this is something that could lead to a lot of shouting. Um, I, I am curious, cause that's something I've, I've seen less of um, at your end. I have less of a, a model of like what you think of, of that space if you've interacted with it or thought about it. But do you have any thoughts on alignment? Is it something that you think is interesting? Is it something you think is high stakes today? As you as you might have noticed, yeah, I haven't interacted with that space too much. Um, personally, I don't. This is not on the on the forefront of of my mind. I think it's a bit of a of a conundrum, right? It. I think I think the age of like AGI to the point where it runs humanity, we can't shut it off anymore, and so on. Um, and and then you know, like the the paperclip collector problems. I don't think, just my personal opinion, I don't think they'll kick in soon. Um, but that's, but again, I realize that if you, you know, if you do the calculation, sort of a, a Pascal's wager thing, um, even though the chance is small and it may be far away, if it isn't, then, you know, the, the implications are quite grave. Um, as you, as you say, right. You know, <laughs> if, if we actually invent something like AGI and, and, and we become either dependent on it or, or it just uh, gains control, then it actually matters. Uh, yeah, I, I personally think there are, just in the space of alignment, there are more near-term issues that we, we haven't, that I'm a bit more scared of. Like, Such as what? Yeah. Like, I just, I just think that... I, I, so right now and in the near future, like let's say my lifetime or, or maybe lifetime of my my immediate descendants, uh, one or two generations ahead, I'm much more scared of what people do with very powerful AI tools, not necessarily AGI, but you know um, the, the, the types of the types of weaponry, the types of control mechanisms, and so on that can be built. Uh, using these tools are already today pretty scary, and in at this rate of progress, I and I do worry. But it's it's not the AGI I worry about, but it is the 
sort of the alignment of the tools that we build and the sort of the societal agreements that we have around them. So I'm really curious to hear what you're, because this is something we talk less about is like, what can what can AI do today that might be concerning? Um, and we'll get to the positive stuff down the road, because I think that it, is, it is really important not to lose sight of the fact that there are two sides to the story, and I don't want this to devolve into exactly the kind of thing I've been complaining about this whole time. But what, what do you think of, of today as being, let's say, the most concerning things and maybe some of the things on the horizon? Um, well, just in, just in terms of statistical models, for, for example, and even the same things probably have always good and bad implications. For example, we have, we have great advances in personalized medicine uh, where models can tell you sort of, you know, you're more at the risk of, let's say, stroke. You might want to change your lifestyle to prevent that or, you know, your joints are really not the best. So avoid this kind of sports and, and so on. And I think this can, this can, you know, this can easily add 10, 20 quality years of life to, to a person's, to a person's, you know, life. And that, that is just like, it's, it's great. I can imagine, you know, if you're, if you're 70 or something and the, the difference between uh, being unhealthy after a life of, of bad health decisions and, and being healthy is, you know, you, you give up all your money to, you know, to switch from one yeah. to the other, like easily. Right. And, uh, so I see, I see a lot of potential there, but at the same time, the same technology is of course, if your health insurance gets an inf- like a hand on that, right. Then, and even that is not as clear cut because then you could say, well, the health insurance can sort of encourage you can lower your premiums if you make these good decisions. But on the other hand, we also know that health insurance is, they really love to, you know, not take people on that, that pose any risk to them. Uh, so, so it's all also, you know, things like facial recognition software, like, you know, I, I'm scared of, of, you know, being tracked everywhere I go. And then, you know, well, fortunately, you've got the sunglasses, so I think you're, you're sure adversary that, that, that makes, that makes all the difference. <laughs> Well, with uh, probably with enough machine learning, you can get around. You can get around that uh, I, as well. I think I think it's an AGI complete problem. I'm I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but also, I mean, of course, you know, facial recognition it can what what have, okay it, it it can ease your life and that you know pay with your face or something. It can also help potentially catch catch dangerous criminals. It can um, I don't know. Well, you think of contact tracing, right? Yeah. Like how, you know, knowing who's together with whom in a case of a pandemic, should, should that ever happen, right? Yeah. Um, so even with the, the same kinds of technologies, there's so, is, is not very often where you only find good things and only find bad things. It is, in my opinion, very much in the, in the application yeah, it it does seem sometimes like there's a sense in which machine learning creates a bunch of slippery slopes, whereas previously we had binary choices. So like if, you know, if today we wanted to track every citizen in their location, it would be pretty like it would require a big affirmative step. You'd have to say, okay, everybody wears an ankle monitor, something you clearly see or something like that. Whereas increasingly with machine learning, it's like, okay, well, now we're just going to combine the video feeds from, you know, N cameras in your immediate vicinity, and we can track you for 60% of the time, and then 60 becomes 80, and 80 becomes 90, and humans aren't great at dealing, yeah, with that kind of continuum reasoning, it feels like. I guess that's that's one dimension. Do you, do you think of malicious use as, as another, like, rather than you know, insurance companies doing things that, that might be defensible. Hey, we're lowering your premiums or we're, you know, doing other stuff that's good, at least for the market at, at the high level. Um, do you see things where, like risk cases where people might say, okay, I'm going to use, I mean, we talk about malicious uses of GPT-3, for example. There was, I think, a, a study out by CSET on that recently. But, um, you know, th- things in that category, do you see that becoming more and more of a thing? Sure, some. I mean, okay, with, with the GPT, I've, I've never really understood. People are like, oh, it can be, it can be used to what, create fake news. And I'm like, well, if, if I want a piece of fake news, I'll just write it like the, like, it's not, it's not in the, it's not in the, like, I don't need a hundred a second, right? I like, 
I need a couple of pieces of fake news to, you know, to spread out, uh, ideally. So I've never really understood that criticism. Uh, but of course, yeah, I, I mean, I can definitely see malicious uses of, of that. Yeah. To, on, on the GPT-3 thing, by the way, I just, because... I happen to have read the reports. This is my opportunity to really shine. This is the moment I've been waiting for. <laughs> One of the things that they talk about is this idea of using GPT-3 as kind of um, a tool for uh, kind of uh, online, disinf not disinformation spreading, but but like, um, well, chatbot style um, stuff like th there was one task that it's really good at called narrative wedging that I found particularly impressive. And it's the idea that you take like you identify a group of people. So let's say you want to get like um, Christians to vote Democrat or something. And so you can you know prompt it for that task. And then it goes on and like comments on threads or whatever. And it can produce some pretty compelling stuff where it's like, hey, you know, like Jesus says, love thy neighbor, you know, something that might superficially map more to Democrat than Republican just based on aesthetic um, and then kind of leverage that to get somebody to do an interesting thing that it wants it to do uh, that I guess that's the sort of thing but I don't know if, if you find that compelling yeah I guess I mean I guess to if you really want to go the route and say okay we're, not, we're we, we'll have it impersonate a bunch of we'll have it impersonate a bunch of of people and and you know, write comments for them. Again, I mean, that's still a task where I'd see just, you know, a bunch of humans being probably equally good at. And it, I guess it depends on the scale, right? If you right. if you want to do this like all across the internet with different people, then okay, I can I can maybe see an application of that. Yeah, it's true. So, so what are you most optimistic about having covered these very dark and dreary possibilities? Where, where like, where do you think in, let's say, five years, we'll be seeing applications of machine learning that are delivering value in ways that might be surprising or unexpected now? So I think we're already seeing the emergence of, of ML applications in science, um, so, sort of in applied science or ML applied to other sciences. Uh, you know, most notably, I guess, DeepMind with something like AlphaFold, um or now the the weather prediction and whatnot so so there, there are these problems drug discovery of uh, i don't know traffic uh you, you name it. i th i think i think sort of the the engineering and 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 so applied science life sciences and so on will benefit a lot in the immediate future from machine learning and i'm yeah i'm pretty excited about that like who who doesn't want better weather forecasts that seems pretty cool especially like it's going to free up so much compute because if, if i ever like every single supercomputer that's built is like okay what's going to run on it the top thing is always like weather simulate cl oh, like, really? <laughs> glo global weather simulation I'm like why but apparently it's a hard problem <laughs> we're going to learn a lot about ourselves based on based on that that ranking of what ends up I, maybe, i'm worried about where it yeah. ends up because it's <laughs> Maybe maybe it's just uh, maybe it's just uh, the the few samples I've seen. I mean, I'm not, I'm not too much into supercomputers, but I've always wondered, like, okay, apparently, like weather simulation and other kind of these you know, like large scale yeah. uh, simulations, they they seem to be yeah. So you know that, that's an opportunity, but also yeah, a, a lot of other other stuff in the analysis of data. So it's interesting that a lot of these applications are sort of, um, it's not that they're hidden from consumers, but they're kind of machine learning in disguise. So like, I don't think most people think of machine learning when they think weather. And I don't think they think of machine learning when they consume a tablet with some kind of, you know, alpha fold five designed drug or something that might come out. Um, I, like, I wonder if, if, you know, five years from now, general appreciation for the state of machine learning will be as far behind as it seems to be today. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Obviously, it's impossible to predict. We need a deep mind powered weather predictor to figure out half the. <laughs> I mean, I, probably it's not going to advance um, super much because I mean, what did what did you know about drug discovery before before like uh, Alpha folder? Or right. Would, like I I knew I knew nothing. I I I thought I. My guess was always like they just try a bunch of stuff, and that's why it's so expensive. Um, but I knew nothing, right? I knew not. I knew very little about protein folding beyond sort of the basics, and so you know, like I think 
most people, it's still going to be like, oh, they have a new drug now, right? It's, it's yeah. just going to be like, they, they, they now have a new drug, which is fine, I guess. I do think that um, people are going to learn more to interact with these statistical systems, uh, maybe more on the, like the front end side. So if you think of today's apps, something like TikTok or so, which is very clearly a machine learning algorithm, it's very... Yeah maybe not super duper sophisticated, but it's, it's clearly like a statistical application. And of course you like, I think maybe TikTok is not too good of an example because essentially you're watching based on what you like, but I, th I think there will be more and more user interfaces where people really feel the statistics, like feel the yeah. application changing as they interact with it. And I, I think a bit like people learn to interact with Google. Yeah. Like today, it's, it's like really natural to you how to search for stuff on the internet. But, uh, you know, you know, the people had to learn. I have to, you know, put some keywords and then, you know, if I want to see how something's done, I, end, I, I like append how to, like it's just like this, 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 how to, or, or yeah. something like this. So people had to sort of learn how to interact with search engines. I think people will also have to learn or will learn just by matter of doing it on how to interact with statistical systems. Yeah, it definitely seems like uh, GPT-3 sort of portends a lot of this where we're seeing more and more focus on prompt engineering. And, you know, I've, I've even heard it said that some people expect like prompt engineering to become a job like you know over time people have to get really good at it's kind of like google search as a service which does not sound like a very yeah. fun job but prompt engineering i mean to the extent that a TikTok star is kind of doing that they're they're interacting with the algorithm they're asking the question hey will you will you like this content or will the average person like it and so on um like i i wonder how much that might reshape society too because you're really kind of changing your personality in so many different ways like it, you know it's not just the the youtuber version of you or the tiktok version of you or the googler version of you or the open ai interacting or gpt3 interacting version of you it's like across the board most of our interactions start to be like that and i like i just wonder what impact that'll have on our personalities I mean, it, it already started a bit with the social networks themselves, right? Facebook and, and, right. and Instagram and so on. But there, it was still the premise that you sort of had your circle of friends and mostly your content was shown to them. And so you would mostly have to think about, okay, what do my friends like? What does my quote unquote audience like? Yeah. But now it's, it's, it's grown more and more into this space of, you know, there's not really... I guess, sorry, I don't, I don't use TikTok. I'm, I'm too, I'm a mold. Okay. I think there is the concept of, of following some, some channels, but I think most of the content is really delivered through the recommendation engine. And yeah, as you say that, that changes behavior a lot in, in not only, right. You don't, you no longer think what, what do my friends think is interesting. You, you now think, okay, how can I, you know, What's the impact of on the system of of this and this and this type of content? Yeah, like more and more of this moving away from a, a Dunbar number of civilization thing, even in the online context. And like you know, with GPT three, in a way, you're kind of trying to you're kind of learning to interact with the some ensemble of of humanity, like trained on the entire internet. And this is very I've I've sort of considered or called it the the collective subconscious, like sort of the i don't know what is it like freudian or jungian yeah, yeah. like the, the 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 collective um i don't know what what they like call all the it. archetypes like, yeah the, the co yeah the collective subconsciousness or something like this right it's it's sort of as you say you ask humanity a question or, or like an aspect of humanity so I'm, I'm curious where your intuition for that comes from. So it's like, um, because some, I'm sure a lot of people listening haven't interacted with GPT-3 yet. So what is it that, um, what is it that causes you to go in that direction? Well, it's, it's sort of, it, it gives you back and, you know, with, with all the disclaimers on, you know, that it, it doesn't have a uniform sampling of data, right? They, they collect the data from some places and so on. So it, it has a skewed view of the world, yada, yada, yada. But in essence, it just continues your text as at least a large portion of humans would do, right? Or like 
a, a somewhat representative uh, subset of, of humans would do. So it's not going to be always the most likely thing because you sample with some temperature, but also it's not, it's not usually going to be something that's super unlikely. Um, so what you'll get is just some aspect of humanity responding to you. Yeah. Um, which is something I've, and I might, I might be overselling this now for someone who's never interacted with GPT-3. It's, it's mostly quite boring. Like, you, <laughs> like you, you, you enter some piece of text and it continues, you go like, huh, yeah, okay. But <laughs> still, uh, I, I think it's, you know, I think it's decently cool. Yeah, like I guess because at my end when I've I've played with it with it for a couple of kind of writing tools things like that, and one of the things I found is the it's almost like and again not to anthropomorphize because as as you say I mean you're easy to take this in the the wrong direction here but it feels like part of what happens with that prompt that you feed it is that it's trying to identify which which human archetype to kind of to channel into like it's got it's something like. Like GPT three isn't this like one you know one brain that has one consistent and coherent view of the world, because because it has to complete so many different sentences that might start sounding like what somebody in Louisiana might say about the sunset to what someone some like SF techie might say about like snowboarding in Canada. Like it almost has a whole bunch of these sub personalities, and depending on what that prompt is, it's almost like you lock into one of them. You know, many different ones might apply to a given prompt. To your point about temperature, like sometimes you don't quite know who you're going to get in the response. But to me, it always felt like there's, yeah, this like ensemble of people behind the scenes type thing. And you never know which one you're going to get, but there's some cluster of them that you're targeting with that prompt. I don't know if that, that's consistent with your experience, but. Yeah, I mean, in a more, in a more maybe on a more technical level, what, what I think is happening, and it's not necessarily, I think a lot of other people think the same is, is um, essentially when you enter a prompt, then the model will go as if it were to go to the training data and and look which things sort of match that prompt and sure it has no access to the training data but it has like a whole lot of weights to store these kinds of things so it will go approximately like as a metaphor you can say it will go look to the training data which things match right and then it will sort of jumble those together um like the continuations of those together into a response and sometimes it contains more of this sample sometimes it contains more of this sample it's usually grammatically pretty correct and you know it, it essentially does this and at that point you have to ask yourself you know do you as a human really do that much more right then like okay maybe if you really sit down you do math or something like you prove a theorem sure but in normal conversation are you really doing that much more than sort of going back to your experience uh, Grapping, like grepping up the the most like the 10 most relevant inputs you've ever had to the current situation and then amalgamate the whatever came, came out of these into a response and like, i'm not sure like i'm not sure it's it's right at least yeah there's there's no to me there's no definitive evidence that you are doing more than this and so you can also see as you say gpt3 as something like just a whole bunch of these because I only have my experiences, but if there's a whole bunch of people all together, you throw in a prompt, you look for first like the people who match more ac most accurately, and then within them, their memories. That might yeah. be kind of a framing of, of what, what it might be like. Yeah. It's interesting though how quickly these levels of explanation seem kind of it, they don't conflict. They all lead to the same prediction. It's just like, I mean, it's like interpreting, it's like interpretations of quantum mechanics or something. There are many different ways to explain the same output, but it is interesting how fraught the debate around which interpretation to choose has become. Like I found this with people, like sometimes you'll, I'll throw out an analogy like the one I just did, which obviously is um, highly kind of, um, uh, anthropic in nature. I mean, I'm, I'm really anthropomorphizing this algorithm. I'm doing it sort of like in a blase way, but some people will really not like that. And, and there, there's almost something that, that 
um, that rejects this idea that no, 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 it's just statistical inference. That is all it's doing. And that this is somehow not, the, it can't be the same thing as what we're doing. There's got to be some almost dualistic, magical kind of thing to human thought. And um, to your point, maybe it is just showing us that human thought is simpler than we, than we believed, or at least this aspect of it. Yeah, I mean, there, there's some legit, let's say, legitimate concerns about really the, the communication that we do as a field. Like if if yeah. we start to if we start to, you know, talk about, oh, this is like, you know, a human and, and so on, then someone who doesn't know what the algorithm actually is might, you know, think, oh, OK, and then go about their their way interacting with these systems right as if they were like ha had, had some sort of humanity inside of them and so there's there's some concern but i, I agree with you that the, the the um the the energy that goes into these debates is is it's a, it's a bit beyond just being concerned about the communication to lay people it's uh it seems a bit more it seems a bit of uh people people's sort of personal yeah, like intuitions and opinions being at stake. Given that we're here with, with GPT-3 uh, at the stage that we're at in the year that we're at, we talked about where you see things going, many more kind of scientific applications of machine learning, that being really exciting. What do you see as the technical accomplishments that are likely in our future that will get us there? Like what are the biggest trends today that you think we can extrapolate? Is it like scaling? Is it open-endedness or, or something else? That that would be nice to know. I've I'm, I have I've been... Let's say I've been surprised by machine learning, you know, quite often. So I, I think if if I can if I can predict something, it's that I'll probably be surprised again. Um, so maybe it's not going to be the things that I that you know that I see right now. Obviously, scaling is one of the things. Like, can we scale more? But we seem to be you know hit, hitting the barriers of how many millions we can dump on a on a single training run of a model but i believe that you know you, like we we as a community will find ways to get around this either by becoming more efficient or by just somehow figuring out how to scale otherwise i'm not sure how that should should go but let's let's i don't know like every time a router routes an ip packet they also at the same time you know, kind of for free, perform a weight update or like some something. I, I have no idea, but yeah, I like agree. Like open endedness is is a big a big issue, but I think it's been a big issue for a long time, right? The exploration exploitation trade off in reinforcement learning has been uh, probably like the first person who thought about reinforcement learning was already like, okay, how, how am I gonna how am I gonna actually make it explore? Yeah. Um, and I think open-endedness has this as a as a central question. And it might be that we now have sort of the computational methods to uh, try out some of these methods. Um, so that might be a, a big, big field. A lot of people are saying graph networks are up and coming because some some hardware now starts to exist for yep. them. Other people are betting on symbolic, symbolic AI combining like neuro and symbolic. Though I'm not sure if that's just not just being salty that neural networks work so well. Like it's like ah, <laughs> so they're like okay, fine, we'll combine them. Yeah, uh, yeah, I I have a really reductionist take on that, which is probably just fueled by ignorance. But I I I keep getting confused about. Like, isn't the story of deep learning just like higher and higher levels of abstraction such that what previously were symbols get abstracted away and kind of optimized through training? Um, I don't know if your take is any different. Maybe I'm missing something obvious here, but that's always kind of been my general sense. Yeah, I mean, it's, an, it's a very interesting question because you, just, just from, from watching your, like our brains is that clearly we do something that's you could call logical inference. Like right. I can clearly think to myself, okay, uh, given A, given B, and given the rule A and B lead to C, you know, therefore C. Like I can do these, these, and I can do them. You know, I can do them fairly quickly. Logical inferences in yeah. in my in my brain. Yet nowhere in my brain is a is a structure that 
you know, handles discrete symbols. Like th th there's just, or, or we yeah. haven't found it yet, right? But my brain is almost, is like entirely made of really specialized types of neurons, but it is still neurons. It's still like these, not continuous, but like spiking signals. And there's just no, there's no logic machine in yeah. the brain, right? So both, both sides have a point, right? Yes, we do do symbolic computation and we seem to be doing it on a fairly low level, like, because it's fairly quick, but also that there's no such apparatus anywhere. So it must be somehow possible using neurons. So I don't know. What I do know is that the, yeah, maybe like the symbolic, like the symbolic exists, the pure symbolicists, it just, it just doesn't seem to actually, yeah, scale. Like, right. The, the problems quickly become so, like, world is just more fuzzy than, yeah, you know, not hot dog or hot dog. It's like, you know, there's a spectrum of hot doginess. And, uh, and, and, and that just really quickly becomes the, the culprit of, of these methods. So I wouldn't necessarily bet on symbolicism making a return, but again, I, mean, I, I was surprised more often than not. So, so in my capacity as the, the like, um, uh, uneducated hot take spewer on, on this particular episode of the podcast, I guess, uh, one of my, one of my things with symbolic reasoning at that level is like, yes, we, we appear to be reasoning symbolically. Um, and there's this temptation to say, okay, so there must be some like transcendent uh, abstractions that we're using that are consistent and blah. But then you realize we make mistakes. We make mistakes when we do our symbolic logic, just like GPT-3 can like do math with small numbers. And then everybody says, oh, it can't do math with big numbers. So therefore it must not like, it must not be able to figure out, but it's like, have you tried doing math with big numbers? What happens? What happens when you get to that? Like there's a threshold where I can't multiply numbers with a certain number of digits either, not to be a schmuck about it, but like, it seems like at least this could be part of the answer. And I'm just kind of confused given the trend with machine learning, the, the trend of abstractions taking over. But I have been wrong about far, far more basic things before. So I'm not going to place any bets on that, that intuition. <laughs> yeah, same. Yeah, I've been, I've been wrong more often than, than, than not. So I'll, I'll just see what happens. That's, that's probably a safe place to be in machine learning. So, okay, no, no hard predictions on the tech that's going to get us there. Totally cool. Is, are, are you generally like... Um, do you, do you see the kind of uh, Rich Sutton argument for the bitter lesson, basically, just that we need more compute power and the story of machine learning, in retrospect, 20 years from now or 50 or 100 years from now, will be told as the story of increasing compute power and increasing amounts of data? Or do you think that these finessings of algorithms are actually going to be a much bigger part of the story going forward? Well, who knows? Um, I, you know, like it's hard to argue with the with the, the the data that if you draw the plot of improvement versus scale, it's like you know, it's it's a it's a log plot, but still, it's like a line, and yeah. and we it doesn't look like that line's gonna stop soon, right? It's more of a problem that we we like physically cannot, you know, bring up the scale to test it, but but it's not like it's hard to argue with that uh, to say like no 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 scale's not going to work anymore it worked till here but it's not going to work like yeah i i think that might very well be our our fate that the story of of machine learning is the story of well you know all these tricks you had turns out you just need you know more data um you know that being said it is interesting that uh, humans, for example, learn from very little data. Mm. We see something like this in GPT-3 with the in-context learning, but still, I think that the plasticity of, of what we appear uh, or experience as, as general intelligence um, is something that might be hard to get, even, even with scale. Ultimately, it comes down to the question, are there problems where curve fitting is just not enough? You know, no matter how, no matter what the curve is uh, yep. that you're fitting, are there problems where where just curve fitting isn't enough? And I'm I'm not sure if if curve fitting is Turing complete or so, but uh, I guess that's that's going to be the question. In, in more practical settings, I, I think 
I'm hopeful that you know, sort of the, the smarter techniques will will triumph because in most practical settings, there's not that much of that much data, right? Or for for whatever reason, right? Could be yeah. could be just because it's a small thing. It, it, maybe it, it only a, ph- a phenomenon, a natural phenomenon that only happened twelve times in the history of the planet, right? So you know, like you good luck training a GPT three on that. Um, or because it's private data or something like this. So I don't think that the smart methods are out, out the window. And in fact, I, I, I think we need more of them because there's just not always going to be the, the scale available. Yeah. As you were saying, I mean, at a certain point, like the, the constraints on compute, the expense of compute might just like force us in that direction in, in the sense that, uh, you know, the sort of fast AI, Jeremy Howard philosophy, you know, how much can I do with limited amounts of compute? Um, has led to people discovering new ways to make more out of the compute that we have. I guess one challenge too is like measurement of this progress because one of the things that's happening now with GPT-3, we talked about open-endedness, more more general systems, is that we're looking at systems that are more flexible, that can do well across a whole bunch of different tasks. And so, I mean, I imagine a lot of these curves that are dependent on like how well do you perform at like this specific, like an image net or how, how well do you perform on your like glue score or whatever it is um, are, well, are, are going to start to not tell the full story where we're going to have to have metrics for like generalization and generality. Have, have you like, have you read much about generalization? Like what, what do you find interesting in that space of, of measuring generalization capabilities? I have no clue. Ultimately, um, I do I do find it so I I find so a benchmark like let's say ImageNet much more it tells you much more if the model wasn't trained for it right right so so these benchmark like, let's like like let's say MNIST you take MNIST and I come to you and I say like I have a new state of the art on MNIST it's like well you know of the of the seven images that the last state of the art misclassified. You, you just happened to get one more right. Like, you know, huh? Yeah. Okay. And an and image net, you know, it's still a challenging problem, but also it'll get to the point where if your goal is to beat image net, then the image net benchmark is much, let's say, less meaningful. Yeah. Whereas if I say, well, all I did was I just trained, like took a general method, trained it on a bunch of images from the internet, um, and then look, it it performs well on ImageNet, and and it also performs well on this this other data set. Then I'm I'm much more inclined to say, yeah, sure, it's a single single benchmark, it's a single you know data point, but still, since the model wasn't trained for it, it is actually a meaningful number. So I think the benchmarks that we have aren't aren't super worth less. Now that being said, sometimes there's like a hidden. This happens in reinforcement learning a lot where people like come up with a general algorithm where, you know, and then they say, well, it solves this problem. Like it solves Montezuma's revenge in Atari. But then you look at the algorithm, like clearly these people wanted to solve this particular thing. They just framed it in such a general way. Right. But right. clearly it's so that there are, there are subtle ways in which things can be tailored. But I think the, yeah, the, the benchmarks are, are are fine. We might need some more or some some more exotic ones, but ultimately, yeah, I, I think they're they're still okay. I mean, it's a good thing that all life problems can be reduced to a special case of uh, Moctezuma's revenge problem. But uh, the, <laughs> the a lot of different ways to bake in those priors in in terms of how these like we, we start to saturate a lot of these benchmarks because we are seeing that with like specialized algorithms you know we've seen how you know as you say mnist basically now is this kind of uninteresting thing and i imagine ImageNet, well actually ImageNet already is headed in that direction with specialized algorithms um as we get into general systems i would imagine the inflection point would be even sharper just because it seems like we have this few shot learning ability this like like sample efficiency that kicks in so you'd expect to go from like total ineptitude to all of a sudden this is a solved problem fairly quickly. I, I like I wonder if we're headed for a future where benchmark definition actually becomes like one of the more important problems in the same way that, you know, in for open ended learning, like just designing, like generating new environments has become its own special thing that has nothing to do with algorithm design. Um, do you see that being a possibility? Sure, absolutely. I mean, it is already a, a problem like benchmark 
definition is already a, right. a very impactful thing. And as, as you say, probably as you go to, to higher and higher, um, I think machine translation, for example, is already there where hmm. they have these metrics like, like, like blur, like, like sort of engram overlaps between gold standards and so on. And, and these are just have become meaningless because yeah. these systems are so good, right? They'll, they'll sometimes they'll just kind of rewrite a sentence to make it seem more something or, you know, like, so, so and, and then ultimately they have to have human experts to, to judge the, the translations because there's just no other way. And even that, I guess, is subjective, even if it's professional. So yeah, I, I think benchmark definitions are going to be very important. I do like, for example, um, the, the ARC challenge. I don't know if you, if you know that by uh, Francois Cholet. It's, it's sort of this, it's, it's, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit like an IQ test, I want to say. It's comprised of these grids of, I think the smallest can be, I don't know, like four by four or so, and the biggest can be like 10 by 10 or so, like these grids. And then uh, there is always going to be like demonstrations so for example, a demonstration is this grid is filled with colored, every cell has a color. And then it's just like a line coming here and there's a bunch of colors here. And then in the next thing, there's a, like the line is drawn out and kind of bounces off of, and then you as a human see, ah, you know, like wall, ball or light ray, uh, right. mirror bounce. Right. And it has like, it will have like two or three examples of this or even one. And then it'll uh, ask the machine to complete uh, this. And, you know, the, the benchmark itself isn't perfect because I don't know, a few humans have come up with these tasks. But still, uh, I, I love the generality of it. And yeah. in, in this case, a, a lot of the decision is actually in the, in the design of the benchmark. But I think Cholet designed the meta benchmark in his, in his, in this, that he, he said, look, here is a good way to design benchmarks and you can design new ones as many as you want. And so even if a method comes that solves the current existing ones, people can come up with new ones. And that's, I think that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it almost seems necessary, especially when you look at, as you say, some of the metrics, like, like the, the, I want to say blue score, that might be my, my friend. Do people say blue or did they say blue? Okay. I've heard I've heard all kinds of things. Yeah. That's the problem with reading papers is you only ever see it written and then you you're like <laughs> this like socially maladjusted person when it comes to conference time because everybody has their own opinions about but but anyway, sc scores like that where you, you kind of have, especially in this weird uh, in-between era where we're moving more towards generality, but a lot of our metrics are still skewed towards specificity. Now, to close things off, we have talked about um, kind of big picture stuff at the beginning. I want to wrap it up with that as well. You know, governance and governments and this this sort of thing. Um, I'd love to get your like your your short take on w what you see as the the future of, of AI from a government standpoint, from a, a country global standpoint. Do you have any views on that at all? It's okay if you don't, because I know it's predicting the future, but every decision where you even think government becoming involved is inherently a difficult decision and a, like a nuanced decision. There's like, you know, points for, points against, yada, yada, yada. So I, I'm not, you know, the, I, my opinions, okay, I express my opinions strongly, but ultimately they're, they're weak opinions. They're, yeah. they're unsure opinions. I, I think it, you know, AI as let's say a tool to, to do things um, is, I guess, like 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 other tools. Like, and I see a place for governments saying, you know, you can't just bludgeon someone with a hammer. You know, you you, you can't just I don't know. You can't just turn on your your GPT three and go I, I don't know online mobbing. On, on someone just because your GPT-3 can impersonate a hundred angry, angry users on Facebook. I, I'm not, I'm making stuff up, right? But sure, yeah. it's as a, as a tool, I think it's, it's going to be subject to regulation and the more powerful it becomes, I think the more subject it is going to be um, for regulation. Now, 
whether or not the, the current, let's say the approach of the European Union or something is, is going to be effective in achieving what they want, I, I, I'm doubtful. I also think government by its nature is slow and is <laughs> given that the rate at which our field advances is probably always going to be like seven steps behind. Like right. they'll be like, well, <laughs> you know, um, we're going to regulate the addition of residual connections now or something, yeah, yeah. something like that, right? So, so it's, it's, uh, so I think it's a challenge for government to come up with dynamic enough rules to, yeah. uh, to, to, to be up to date. Um, and then there's the, the sort of meta question of with, with how the field's developing, there's also concerns about, let's say, monopolies forming, sort of AI monopolies, Right. We already see this with, with scaling. There's only very few, inst- well, there's still enough institutions, but if we scale up again, there's going to be very few institutions that are even capable of training these super big models. And if they turn out to be like, uh, you know, very impactful, then all of a sudden you have like a problem where, I don't know, you know, there's, <laughs> there's, there's like Huli and Huli has, Huli has the big AI, right? And and Huli now decides who can use the big AI and what it's used for and which outputs it filters. Um, yeah. So I'm not I'm not averse to to regulation, but I'm also not super confident that like it's still government. It's like yeah. there's still not it's still not like the most the most competent uh, body on the planet. So you know you have a lot of people who will say like I think that. Um, you know, government is, is doing a terrible job at this, and yet we like we we need it to do something about this. And both can be true at the same time. There's no like contradiction there. Yeah, just because that's the nature of the beast. Um, yeah, and then I guess that there's the more the more abstract questions, which also fall into the realm of government. Like, is AI a person? Like, right? Okay, we right we see now this this can AI be listed as an inventor of patents? This yes, is Australia, no, right? like. Well, just, yeah, I mean, they, they, I think they bring the cases. It's a PR stunt, right? But they bring these cases in, in all the countries. I think it got rejected in the US, but accepted in Australia. But but still, right? Is is this a person? Like, you know, how how yeah, you know, how how should this how should this be treated? And yeah, so it, it also knows? that one seemed especially wild to me, given that we're talking about like AI systems today. Like people are obviously thinking about like you know, GPT-2, like uh, the, anyway, text generation, other systems we have today with like basic RL and stuff. But like in the limit, at least if you have a materialist reductionist kind of philosophy in the limit, yeah, you will end up getting like just humans. So it, it's got to be, there's got to be more nuance to it than like is AI, is like, is some computing processing engine a human or can be an inventor or whatever? It just seems very kind of myopic and, and short-sighted, at least through through my narrow lens. I hope we can all get our get our acts together in time for this stuff. And if you're right, we've got plenty of time for it. So that's uh, hopefully a good thing, at least through that, uh, at that level. Yannick, thanks so much for uh, for joining me for this. This is a lot of fun. Thank you very much for having me here.